Well, let's stand as we sing page number 126. Blessed Redeemer, all three verses, please. Blessed Redeemer. Up Calvary's mountain, one dreadful morn, walked Christ my Savior, weary and worn, facing for sinners, death on the cross, that he might save them from endless loss. Blessed Redeemer, Precious Redeemer, seems now I see him on Calvary's tree. Wounded and bleeding, for sinners pleading, blind and unheeding, dying for me. Father, forgive them, thus did he pray. E'en while his life blood flowed fast away, praying for sinners while in such woe, no one but Jesus ever loved so. Blessed Redeemer, precious Redeemer, seems now I see him on Calvary's tree. Wounded and bleeding, for sinners pleading, blind and unhealed. If you have been thinking of your salvation as we get to that chorus, Blessed Redeemer, Precious Redeemer, keep those thoughts going as you sing verse number three. Oh, how I love him, Savior and friend. How can my praises ever find end? Through years unknown, on heaven's shore, my tongue will praise him forevermore. Blessed Redeemer, precious Redeemer, seems now I see him on Calvary's tree. and bleeding for sinners pleading blind and unheeding dying for me please remain standing for welcome part of our call to worship this morning from Psalm 20 was verse 7 that says some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. That's our memory verse for the month of November, so I invite you to join me in saying that, beginning with the reference. Psalm 27. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you for this time to be in your presence with worldly pressures and conflicts and upheaval and attractions set aside to focus on you, to uh, come in our union with your son to uh, be part of your fellowship and sing your praises and stand under your word. Lord, your word is inspired and profitable for doctrine, reproof, and for correction, and for instruction. We don't know what we should know, Lord, so give us your doctrine. We don't do what we should do, so give us reproof. We don't go the way we should go, so give us correction. 
And Lord, we don't do what we should do, so give us tonight your instruction in righteousness. Be honored by the way we conduct this service, and uh, may each heart be encouraged in your word, challenged from your word to follow you better. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated, and just want to remind you of a couple of things that probably are already on your radar, I hope. Our regular services, of course, on Wednesday, men's uh, book study tomorrow morning or uh, sorry, excuse me, Tuesday morning. Come Tuesday morning, men, if you can, even if you're not a regular, help us pray on that uh, important election day. I want to encourage everyone to get out and vote if you haven't already done so. And there are plenty of voter guides back in the back. Once again, you can take those into the voter polls. Uh, some have been caught off guard when you get into the booth there and find questions about judges and other positions that you may not know their standing or uh, uh, their, their uh, positions on key issues, so those voter guides will be very helpful for you uh, for that. Uh, take as many as you like if you want to pass some of those out. Um, and then Wednesday prayer meeting, Saturday a couple of events to have on your calendar, men's prayer breakfast. We're planning to bring that back and it'll maybe look a little different, but uh, uh, we'll still, uh, same guys, same, uh, same time, same place and uh, some of the same goodies and praying to the same Lord. So please join us for that Saturday morning. And then Saturday afternoon is when the Stewardship Lifestyle Seminar begins. And that'll be right here in the auditorium this coming Saturday, four o'clock. That first general session once again is on budget planning. Uh, the second session is at seven, give you a chance to catch supper in between, hopefully a seven o'clock session on estate planning. And then uh, combined Sunday school, when you arrive next Sunday morning, all the adult classes will be here in the main auditorium to hear about teaching biblical financial principles to the next generation. Uh, useful for parents, useful for grandparents, and uh, even anyone who has uh, contact with the next generation. And then in the morning service, the evening service as well. Many opportunities for you to sharpen your uh, knowledge uh, in handling biblical handling your finances in a biblical way. Still a few slots to sign up, and if you were just waiting to give someone else the opportunity, uh, this is the last week, so go ahead and fill those slots up and, and uh, make good use of Mr. Steve Board. He's the Director of Development at Maranatha, teaches in the business school, and uh, you'll be equipped and uh, encouraged by what he has to share this coming Saturday and Sunday. Let's go back to song. In our verse for the month, I will cause to make mention the name of the Lord our God as an alternate translation for remember. You won't remember this, it's just the hyphio verb stem. Hebrew has several verb stems we don't in English, but that's one of a causative nature. I will cause this to happen, and I will cause to make mention the name of the Lord our God. When I first ran into that, I thought, wow, this is my responsibility and privilege to bring up God whenever I can and help others toward him. Uh, don't ask my wife how successful I am at this, but I told the bus kids they come from troubled families uh, before COVID hit, and my wife and I had them during the morning service in the back, 15 to 20 or whatever it was, and, and I told them my, my job is, is with my wife is, is to uh, get out of her way, um, to bring my God and my wife together and get out of the way. So if she burns the toast, that's uh, not my problem. I'm supposed to eat burnt toast for the morning. That's just all it is. That's no problem at all. Uh, you know, and uh, of course, there's no toast in our family anymore, I don't think, unless I burn it. But, uh, but we as believers uh, have a joyful, joyful experience in living for the Lord Jesus Christ. And we can cause our God to be made mention. We can remember him at every opportunity. And what a joy that is. We have a little chorus. I sing a new song. Let's have the men sing this. And the ladies echo, if you would, please. As we sing number 257, I sing a new song. Men, then ladies. I sing a new song. Since Jesus came, serve the new master. Wear a new name. Walk a new road. Have a new goal, know a new peace down deep in my soul. Charles F. Weigel's wife forgot about that when she left him. 
She said he was one of the good teachers at, uh, in Chattanooga, there at the college out of Highland Park Baptist Church. And uh, she said she wanted some of the excitement that she had missed being his wife. He was a pastor and a teacher. She only lived five years after she left him. And that limited his ministry, of course. But after that, he wrote this wonderful song, No One Ever Cared For Me Like Jesus. I would love to tell you what I think of Jesus Since I found in him a friend so strong and true I would tell you how he changed my life completely He did something that no other friend could do No one ever cared for me like Jesus us. There's no other friend so kind as he. No one else could take the sin and darkness from me. Oh, how much he cared for me. All my life was full of sin when Jesus found me. All my heart was full of misery and woe. Jesus placed his strong and loving arms around me, and he led me in the way I ought to go. No one ever cared for me like Jesus. There's no other friend so kind as he. No one else could take the sin and darkness from me. Oh, how much he cared for me. Every day he comes to me with new assurance. More and more I understand his words of love. But I'll never know just why he came to save me Till someday I see his blessed face above No one ever cared for me like Jesus There's no other friend so kind as he no one else could take the sin and darkness from me. Oh, how much he cared for me. At this time, Gloria will come and minister before the Lord in song.
humbly entreat. I wait, blessed Lord, at thy crucified feet. By faith for my cleansing, I see thy blood flow. Now wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Whiter than snow, Lord. Oh, whiter than snow. Wash me. Gently wait, come now and within me a new heart create. To those who have sought thee, thou never said no. Now wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. That song is based almost in its entirety upon Isaiah 118. Though your sins be as scarlet, they should be white as snow. Though they be red as crimson, they should be as wool. Charles Spurgeon always misquoted that verse, reversing those two, about the only thing he ever did wrong in his preaching. Oh, he did, of course, in his church. He graduated from the elder board to the deacon board, which is not the scriptural pattern in, in scripture as well. But what a verse and what a song someone was meditating upon. I'd like us to, if you would, quote uh, from your memory, Proverbs 3, 6, uh, now I'm saying this and I can't get it right. Um, Proverbs 2, 5 and 6, trust in the Lord just to prepare ourselves for this next song. Let's say it together, would you please? Trust in the Lord with all thine heart and lean not unto thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. Trusting Jesus. <clears throat> Simply trusting every day, trusting through a stormy way, even when my faith is small. Trusting Jesus, that is all. Trusting as the moments fly. Trusting as the days go by. Trusting Him, whate'er befall. Trusting Jesus, that is all. Brightly doth his spirit shine into this poor heart of mine. While he leads, I cannot fall, trusting Jesus, that is all, trusting as the moments fly. Trusting as the days go by, trusting him. 
him whate'er befall, trusting Jesus, that is all. Singing, if my way is clear, praying, if the path be drear, if in danger for him call, trusting Jesus, that is all. Trusting as the moments fly, trusting as the days go by, trusting him whate'er befall, trusting Jesus that is I invite you to turn in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 2 as we continue the Persevere series and exhortations from that book. I uh, hope you enjoyed a sunset on your way to church tonight. That's new, beautiful sunset, and uh, might change what time that's setting based on uh, our calendar coming up. Going into winter here, as we can tell, but it looks like we have some pleasant fall ahead to jo- enjoy this week. Persevere means to keep going when things are difficult. This has been a, a season for us to uh, keep the truths of Scripture forefront, the faithfulness of our Lord and His secure promises forefront in our thinking, lest we slip away so that we might persevere. We looked at a few major points as we now uh, go toward the end of the second chapter, we've seen that we should persevere in our sure and finished faith because Jesus is worth it. And then the big Roman numeral two that occupies most of chapters one and two is that believers must persevere in that sure and finished faith because Jesus is better than the angels. And uh, the writer took a break from that argument to Uh, bring up some fruit from it in the first few verses of chapter 2 to give us that first of several warning passages here in the book of Hebrews. Uh, Because Jesus is better than the angels, the covenant mediated through him is a covenant that we cannot ignore. If that which was uh, revealed to angels, chapter 2 starts, proved to be steadfast, uh, how much more should we pay attention Give the closer heed to uh, the instructions of the New Testament, lest we slip away. And he picks up again uh, in chapter 2 and uh, verse 5 with that contrast once again between Jesus Christ and the angels. And uh, just to uh, review, a passage review of Hebrews chapter 2 verses 5 through 9, last time we were uh, in this text, which Uh, has been a few weeks now, we saw uh, what God designed, and that was for angels to be over man, and yet man over creation. This is the eighth psalm where the psalmist writes, when I consider the works of your hands, what is man that you are mindful of him? Yet you have crowned him with glory and honor. That crown of honor that was the dominion mandate over the earth Uh, is a crown that mankind did not earn. Though man was unworthy, lower than the angels, God in His grace saw fit to give the dominion mandate to Adam and Eve. Well, of course, because of sin, that dominion became much harder, and so we fight against thorns and thistles, and we fight against the, the fear and the ferocity of the animal kingdom. We fight against a world that's plagued by disease and disaster. Hope you're praying for the Bruner family who are in the path of that uh, Category 5 super typhoon uh, last evening. Uh, Because their power is out, it may be a while till we uh, hear a good report from the Bruners, so keep praying. We believe that the prayers of believers can divert a typhoon if that's what the Lord sees fit. So pray for the Bruners and those that they minister to. We uh, We see what God designed, but what we don't see is the world subject to man or to the Son of Man. But what we do see, the author points our attention to uh, in verse 
9, we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, and for the suffering of death was crowned with glory and honor. So that dominion mandate, that crown of glory and honor that we did not earn, and that we fall short of fulfilling, Jesus Christ did earn by becoming one of us, and by His suffering and death, exalted with an earned crown of glory and honor, now waits until the Father puts all things under His feet, and He will uh, reign over creation in a perfect fulfillment of the dominion mandate. But now we see Him made a little lower than the angels, verse 9, for the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor that He, by the grace of God, should taste death for every man. So we praise the Lord, we praise Jesus, our Savior, for tasting death uh, on our behalf. And if you're saved, uh, you don't need to fear death because Jesus tasted it for you. If you're not saved, the Bible tells us He tasted it for every man, for every human, so that God's grace and forgiveness can be applied to you if you'll believe and trust in that death as a payment for your sin. Well, the passage preview for the next several verses as we try to finish out the chapter this evening uh, is that the writer will continue to present Jesus as the one uh, whom we should persevere in following because of his tremendous worth and his clear superiority over the angels and as fascinating as ma- and as majestic and as powerful as those uh, heavenly beings are. If Jesus is far superior to them, then he's worth following. It's worth it to persevere. And if the covenant that was mediated through Jesus is every bit as sure and steadfast as that mediated through the angels at Sinai, we should continue to pay closer attention to it. We should listen to the message of the New Testament. And so in simple terms, Jesus is worth following and the New Testament is worth listening to. That's everything the writer is driving at. And these are basic things that most of us would nod our heads and say we agree with, but those priorities come into question in our daily lives. And as our security is threatened or our balance is knocked off by by uh, things that we encounter. And as the skeptics and agnostics and atheists grow louder, it's so important that we are reinforced in these truths that Jesus is worth following and that the New Testament is worth listening to. Uh, This morning, we looked at the last uh, several verses of chapter 12 and... um, That's really the climax of the book. Uh, Kind of hated to reveal that as we're working uh, rather uh, deliberately. Uh, That's a nice way of saying we're going slowly, uh, going through this book. But now you you have a picture, if you were here this morning, of where we're going with this, what the writer is building up to, and we'll we'll, uh, lay the groundwork to uh, make those lessons even more meaningful and to gain lessons along the way. Isn't it interesting how you can continue to glean new truths from God's Word, even in passages you're familiar with, even when we're talking about topics that you're uh, very well versed in, that His mercies are new every day, that His Word is a, though it's uh, simple, it is complex and it is compound and it is multifaceted so that where you are today, you'll read it differently than where you were yesterday in your walk with the Lord, and in the way the Spirit illumines these things to us. Let's look then at verse 10 as we enter this last paragraph of the second chapter that will round out this major argument of Jesus being better than the angels. The Bible says, It became Him for whom are all things and by whom are all things. And the writer of Hebrews, as we've noticed, as he draws generously from the Old Testament, specifically the book of Psalms, holds a firm command on scriptural Old Testament truths and trusts his readers to have the same. 
And if you're not paying very close attention, and sometimes even if you are, it takes some pretty intense interaction with the text to keep up with his arguments and his line of reasoning. And so let's do that some this evening, just interact and ask the questions of the text. For it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all things. Let's pause there. Who is he talking about? Who is the one for whom are all things and by whom are all things? Who is that? Heard a lot of the name Jesus. Any other answers? Okay. And that's a good answer. And we would expect that answer. And in fact, the first chapter laid the groundwork so that that is a correct possible answer to this description. But as the verse goes on, we'll see that he's talking about God the Father. And the reason, you know, if that was a trick question, if that was a setup, uh, is to reinforce uh, in our minds the fact that God is triune. And when we're talking about God the Father, when we're talking about God the Son, we are talking about Yahweh, and He is one. And so those things attributed to the Son in chapter 1 that are here attributed to the Father in chapter 2 show us clearly that Jesus is God. All right, so uh, it became Him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons to glory. Who are those sons brought to glory? I heard us, that's you and I. As we are saved, uh, we share in uh, the presence of God and that sense of glory, uh, the glory of salvation. It, was, it became Him for whom are all things, by whom are all things, in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. Who is the captain of our salvation? Jesus. And so it is the Father he's referring to, in bringing us to glory who made the Son perfect through suffering. He says it is becoming. It became Him. Verse 10. And so, uh, again, a smart answer when we say, who's the one by whom all things are and for whom all things are? To say Jesus. Because in chapter 1, we read that it was by Jesus that all things were created. We read that Jesus is the heir of all things. And at, toward the end of chapter 1, God the Father says to God the Son, You, Lord, laid the foundations of the earth. And so Jesus and the Father, clearly one, interchangeable in what is credited to them uh, in this uh, synergistic work of creation that God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit all were involved in. But the verse starts by saying here in verse 10 that it became him. Okay, we don't talk that way very often, but maybe you've uh, read this or seen it in like the uh, shows or movies that are set back in the 17th, 18th, 19th centuries where someone will say, for example, oh, that dress you're wearing is very becoming. Or, uh, yeah, man, that behavior is not becoming of one who holds such and such an office. Okay, it, it became God that he should make Jesus perfect through suffering. And I'm thankful that the Bible puts it in those terms because to me, uh, that doesn't seem becoming um, when we think of our exalted view of our God and we look at the world around us and the evil, and when I look at in my own heart and see the evil, we would say, Lord, our whole race is not worthy of one drop of blood of your divine Son. But God's perspective, recorded for us through by inspiration, is that it became Him. It is becoming of God to make Jesus perfect through suffering. In what sense is it becoming? Uh, because in bringing many sons to glory, God's purpose is fulfilled. In making the captain of our salvation perfect, God's name is glorified. And so to what, uh, what to us seems backwards and a tremendous step of grace, God considers becoming. And we say, praise you, Lord. Praise you, God our Father, 
for your grace, for your love that sent Jesus to die for us so that he might bring many, many sons and daughters to glory. Our next question to interact with the text then in verse 10 is, in what sense does Jesus, the captain of our salvation, the forerunner of our salvation, we could say, the founder of our salvation, in what sense is he made perfect through suffering? Because Jesus, uh, chapter 1, showed us in no uncertain terms Uh, how worthy and exalted Jesus is. So why is it that he needed something? You could, someone might pose the question, uh, to be made perfect. Does this imply that he was, before this suffering, imperfect in some sense? And to answer that question, we need to just um, examine the purpose of this suffering and the result it had on the uh, status, the position of Jesus. And um, I don't want for this illustration to be um, irreverent at all, so please understand this is coming from a point of illustrating this that I think you'll find is, in fact, reverent. But uh, Pastor Jeremy and I were working through a book on holiness a month or so ago and read an illustration uh, where the writer talks about kicking a soccer ball around in the backyard with his five-year-old son. And uh, the five-year-old can kick the ball as hard as he can, and it goes only a few feet. And so the dad is limiting his power and just limiting his kicks to kicks of a few feet. After a while, just to kind of show his son what he's capable of, uh, he kicks the soccer ball over his son's head the length of the field and into the goal. And he says his son was so impressed that this five-year-old boy said, wow, Dad, only you and Jesus could make that shot. (laughs) And if a 15-year-old said that, maybe that's irreverent. But for a five-year-old who's saying, wow, I know God can do anything, but I've never seen anyone do anything like that, so I don't want to say that my dad can do something Jesus can't do, so he's making sure to give all that credit. So let's, for a moment, just ask ourselves the question. We're just being hypothetical for, for illustration's sake. Um, is Jesus the greatest soccer player? And some of you who are very doctrinal, theological, reverent in your approach would say, how foolish. Of course not. Jesus has no concern with sports. And if he did, it wouldn't be soccer. (laughs) Others, maybe who are more flexible, would say, "Um, well, Jesus is... Uh, he's, um, he's omnipresent as God. Uh, if, when he uh, chooses to function that way, outside of the incarnation, his presence at the right hand of the Father. Um, he, of course, is all-powerful as God. So yes, he could stop every goal and he could score every goal at will. So yes. And the answer really is somewhere in between. We could say that ideally he would be, hypothetically, that if there were eternal value in such things, that he would be so... But experientially, we can't say that he is the perfect soccer player because he is not a soccer player. All right, the point of all that, and please forgive me if that's trite, but is just to demonstrate that though Jesus could ideally be a perfect Savior, could hypothetically or theoretically be so, to be experientially a perfect Savior required this suffering. From God's perspective. That is the sense in which he is made perfect because before his suffering, he could be ideally a good savior, but to be experientially a perfect savior required his incarnation, his earthly ministry, and his atoning death on the cross and resurrection from the grave. That makes him experientially the perfect Savior. So uh, quickly this evening, as we look at Jesus, we see that Jesus is perfect experientially. And we'll look at three ways in which he is so. One, he is perfect experientially in his suffering. Verse 11 says, For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one. You don't have to answer out loud here, but let's think. Who is the one that sanctifies? 
And we'll find that it is, in fact, in this case, though God the Father or God the Son either might come to your mind because of the unity of the triune Godhead that he's referring here to. Jesus is the one who sanctifies. Who are the ones who are sanctified? That would be you and I as we're saved, as we grow in our walk with him. He that sanctifieth Jesus and they who are sanctified, believers, are all of one. Who is that one? That one is God the Father. And what he's saying there is that uh, when, because Jesus was made uh, human, uh, because in his carnation, incarnation he took on flesh and blood, uh, that we are from one in the, in the sense that God made uh, Jesus perfect through suffering, He's, he sanctifies us through Jesus' suffering. We are of one in that sense. Or in a greater way, uh, Jesus submits Himself as the Son to the headship of God the Father, and we, as we become believers, submit ourselves as sons to the headship of God the Father. So He that sanctifies Jesus, and we who are sanctified, believers, are all of one. We are all relating to God the Father in the same sense. And that can blow our minds to think that we can relate to God the Father in the same sense that Jesus does. And we do that by sharing in His suffering, both uh, vicariously as He died for us on the cross and in our uh, daily trials that we endure for Him in living for holiness. For which cause? Verse 11 ends. He is not ashamed to call them, those who are sanctified, his brethren. And here again, we have to simply be thankful for the condescending grace of God to put it in such terms, because in the interest of reverence, I don't know if we'd be comfortable to put it in such terms if it wasn't inspired for us in such a way in Scripture. That Jesus would not be ashamed to call believers his siblings. Have you ever been ashamed to call your sibling your sibling? Don't nod your head if that person is sitting next to you just now, please. But aren't there those times, maybe you're the older sibling, and after a couple years of developing your reputation at school, now your younger sibling comes to that same school and you say, please don't embarrass me. And when that younger sibling inevitably acts in an embarrassing way, what's the temptation of the older sibling is to say, I don't know that person. We're not related. We just carpool. We look alike. We're ashamed of our siblings when they embarrass us. And I would never tell stories embarrassing my siblings except for once in a while. And I remember a time as a kid when one of my younger sisters was in the basement of the church after a service, several kids, that was kind of the area to go and play around. And she was doing an experiment. She climbed up on the table, uh, opened an umbrella, and jumped off the table to see if you really could float down like a parachute style like Mary Poppins or like they do in the movies. It didn't work. It didn't work the second time. It didn't work the third time. And my sibling's uh, uh, unanimous plea to my sister was, don't do this experiment when people are watching. You know, our friends are here. You're embarrassing us. And wouldn't we look at our foolish behavior and our willful shortcomings And even times when around unsaved people upon whom we want to make a good impression, that we would even be tempted to be ashamed of our relationship with the Lord. That He is not ashamed to call us brothers. That when you trusted Christ as Savior, that God the Father said, This is my Son. You are now my daughter. And Jesus looks at us and says, this is my sister. This is my brother. Not ashamed to call us brothers. 
and it's more meaningful because he was made perfect experientially in his suffering. It's not like uh, when you uh, go into, uh, maybe you have a flat tire and someone helps you. And you see people say to each other, oh, thanks, bro. Oh, that's my bro. Or uh, we, we grew up and we were just close. We were always hanging out together. That person's a brother to me. No, but it's one who literally took on flesh and blood and shared in our experiences, became a member of the seed of Abraham physically, as we become spiritually, became a member of the seed of Adam physically, the seed of Eve physically, I should say, even as we are members of the seed of Eve physically, and so that spiritually he might call us brothers and sisters. saying, and here he'll continue to draw on the Psalms, verse 12, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the church, I will sing praise unto thee. A quotation of Psalm 22, 22. And again, and here he introduces another quote, if you're putting quotes in or your copy of Scripture may already have these. I will put my trust in him, end quote. And that is either Psalm 18.2 or uh, Isaiah 8.17 could be referenced there. And again, a third quote, as the writer continues to draw on the Old Testament and his rich knowledge of that. I will uh, uh, behold I and the children which God hath given me. So three Old Testament texts that demonstrate Jesus' acceptance of siblings. That he, though the firstborn in status before God the Father, uh, shares that status with siblings and puts himself in submission unto the Father. I will put my trust in him. Behold, I and the children that God has given me. And that first, being the most, most powerful in verse 12, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. That's a quotation of Psalm 22. And with your finger here in Hebrews 2, I invite you to turn back to that text, Psalm 22. And this, I hope, is a psalm that, like the writer of Hebrews, you have some familiarity with because it is a messianic psalm, one we reference often, uh, one that Jesus referenced directly uh, in his suffering on the cross. So do you remember this one? It starts with those words, My God, why hast thou forsaken me? That Jesus spoke on the cross. Oh, the psalmist is writing many generations before the incarnation. This psalm finds its fulfillment in the atoning work of Jesus on the cross. He trusted the Lord, verse 8, that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him. Isn't that what the people said? As they passed by the cross, or at the end of verse 16, they have pierced my hands and my feet. Difficult to see how this could be applied to David. Crucifixion, a form of execution not yet invented in his day, but fulfilled in Jesus. They parted my garments, verse 18, among them, and cast lots for my vesture. And in this bleak hour of suffering that the psalmist describes and that Jesus fulfills in horrific reality. He does so with faith in the Father, submission to the Father, but he does so with a confident hope in what the result of his suffering will be. And it's in this context of this excruciating, in fact, that's where we get the word from that Latin word for cross and crucifixion, in this excruciating experience where Jesus is bearing the sins of the world, he looks forward and he sees, verse 22, a time when he will declare the name of the Father unto his brethren. Because Jesus knew, even while on the cross, that this suffering would bring many sons to glory. Sons whom he would not be ashamed to call call brethren. Jesus endured the cross knowing that that suffering would win you and would win you the right to be his 
spiritual family member and to bring you into unity with the Father. And so he says, I will declare thy name unto my brethren. I will have brothers, siblings because of this someday. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise thee. And back in chapter 2, as the writer of Hebrews quotes that, in verse 12, he says, In the midst of the church, I will I sing praise unto thee. And what an encouragement to recognize that even as we saw in this morning's text of Hebrews chapter 12, that as we gather as a congregation, that Jesus is here with us. And that Jesus uh, considers himself indeed is our spiritual sibling. And indeed Jesus sings with us as we give praise to the Father. I will declare thy name unto my brethren. In the midst of the church will I sing praise unto thee. What an encouragement that in the literally what was the darkest hour of history, as Jesus hung on the cross, physical darkness was there, spiritual darkness certainly, that Jesus could look forward and say, I will tell of God's praise. I will sing his praise with my brothers and sisters spiritually. And so we, as we face trials, as we face difficult things, and in times of darkness, can look forward and say, God will receive glory from this, that on the other side of this, whether by my life or my death, I will be with spiritual siblings and with Jesus and will praise the Father because he will work all things together for good. Though things are dark and though I suffer, good will come of this if I am faithful, as Jesus was faithful on the cross, being made experientially perfect in his suffering. Rather than continuing on and finishing out the chapter, which we'll save for next time, I want to just echo one verse from this morning's text that we didn't take time to dwell on, and that was at the end of chapter 12. Chapter 12 and verse 28, if you want to look at that verse one more time, just as we close. After talking about the company of worship and the mount that we are come to when we gather in God's presence. He says, Hebrews 12, 28, Wherefore we, receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace, whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. Aren't you thankful that we've come to a kingdom, that we are citizenships, citizens excuse me, in a kingdom that cannot be moved? Verse 28, it cannot be shaken, it cannot be knocked over, it cannot be overcome. Nothing can touch this kingdom of which we are citizens. Uh, Back in March, each one of us was shaken to some degree as we faced questions like, what if the grocery shelves remain empty? What if the virus proves more contagious and more deadly than they have assumed? What if uh, my place of business closes down, my job is no longer secure? What if these things happen? Will I be okay? And once again, our earthly kingdoms were shaken in April, as at least somewhere in your subconscious, maybe you asked questions like, what if the rioting and looting escalates? What if... I'm not allowed to leave my home. What if it should come to my neighborhood? Will I be okay? And many of you even now and this week wrestle with the anxiety of questions like, what if the person that I vote for is not elected? What if the freedoms religiously and politically that I hold dear are threatened? What if uh, the economy on which I depend financially uh, is put into uh, instability, will I be okay? And so we rejoice that we have received a kingdom that cannot be moved, that cannot be shaken, because all of our kingdoms, whether it's your personal domain, your family, your workplace, this church, 
our country, the very world we live in, all of these will be shaken and are shaken and have been shaken. Let us rejoice as citizens of heaven that we have come to a kingdom and received a kingdom that cannot be moved. We go forth in that confidence. We spread that enthusiasm. And as people look to us for our reaction to what happens in the coming days and the baggage that we're carrying from the days past, that they will see people of faith, people of joy, people who citizenship is in heaven, a kingdom that cannot be moved. We thank the Lord for His suffering that makes Him experientially perfect to be our Savior And so as you face trials this week, look to Him, turn to Jesus, uh, the One who is our Savior, the One who calls us brother and sister. Let's pray. Lord, we praise You for the truths revealed in Scripture. Thank You, Lord, for the methodical way that these arguments are strung out for us so that we can follow, so that we can Uh, take your word and begin to digest it, digest it, and to allow the truths that it contains to fortify us, to strengthen our faith, to make us more well-rounded in our uh, view of the world, our view of ourselves, our view of each other, and ultimately our view of you as we see you, Father, through your Son that you sent for us, that you might bring us to glory. We praise you, Lord, that you saw it fitting that you found it becoming of you. And we praise you, Lord Jesus, that you are not ashamed of us, that when we fail you, we would run back to you quickly, that we would forsake earthly pleasures to follow you alone and to walk in the path that you set for us during those days of your ministry among us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. In his message this morning, Pastor Stevens mentioned that there was one way you can attempt to approach God on Mount Sinai, but it can't be done. It's a terrible place for a man to attempt to meet God on the law, which no one can keep perfectly. If you are here tonight without the Lord Jesus Christ or listening online, there will come a time when before God you're going to need a friend, a lawyer, an advocate to take your case And that can only occur if you will take him first. So if you have not yet received Christ as your Savior, you need that friend in Jesus Christ. And if you would come this evening as we stand and seeing number 260, what a friend we have in Jesus. Someone will take the word of God with you to a side room and share with you how you and Christ can together meet God the Father in heaven as not just a sibling, but a Savior and a friend. And if tonight, then, brothers or sisters in Christ, if you wish to make this platform an altar and for some reason you want to express something here tonight as Christ, as your friend, and what we've seen tonight in the message, as a wonderful, wonderful Savior, experiencing everything we can ever hope to experience and all of the pain of our life, Everything. You say Christ never had to have a stop sign. No, no, no. It's, it's the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and pride of life. He resisted all of that for you. And then died for your sins. If there's some way that God wants you tonight to draw closer to him, feel free to make that public and come forward and pray or to pray for someone else. What a friend we have in Jesus. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. We do not carry everything to God in prayer. Have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Can we find
find a friend so faithful who will all our sorrow share. Jesus knows our every weakness. Take it to the Lord in prayer. All right, after the service, there is a small ensemble practice. Is that correct in the... Uh, that was before. All right. If you want another one, well, you can try to, but uh, it's already done. May God bless you as you leave and go grow in, get in grace. Go in grace and grow in his grace as well. Let's pray. Father, we praise you. Uh, we have no words that we can utter that can approach the gratitude that we should feel. And we confess we feel a greater gratitude than we can express. And we want that to grow. We have a groaning in us that the Holy Spirit must interpret with groanings that cannot be uttered, ours and, and then the mysterious language of heaven, how he interprets this to your ears, all because of Jesus Christ. I pray, Father, as we've heard tonight, Jesus is better. He's better than the problems we're going to have tomorrow. He's better than the difficulties the accidents that may be waiting for some of us around the corner, the illnesses, he'll take us through it all. Help us, Father, just to rest under the shadow of his wings with great delight, meditating upon his perfections, his glories, his virtues, and his friendship to us. May he become more to us, Father, as we leave and more as we lay our head upon the pillow tonight, having fellowshiped with you and the Holy Spirit and our beloved Savior one last time, resting all of our cares with you and accepting the challenges of loving you better tomorrow as we meditate in your word to begin the day. May that be true of everyone within the sound of my voice now. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. We are dismissed. <laughs>